as we have another official that is going to provide his statements. Mr. President of the General Assembly, United Nations Secretary General, heads of state and delegation, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset I would like to congratulate His Excellency Salva Karoshi for his election as President of the 77th Session of the United Nations General Assembly and I wish to express to him our best wishes for success in leading this session. Allow me also to pay a well-deserved tribute to His Excellency Mr. Abdullah Shahid, the outgoing President of the General Assembly, for the vim and vigor which he put into the work of the 76th session. I welcome and pay tribute to the Secretary General's leadership, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, in these times of manifold and complex crises around the world and we reiterate to him Chad's full friendship and support. Mr. President, this session, based on the theme A Watershed Moment, Transformative Solutions to Interlocking Challenges, is beginning as humankind is facing numerous un challenges unprecedented since the establishment of our organization. These are successive serious and complex challenges coming one after another. So many that we are struggling with our collective efforts to overcome them. This situation must tug on all of our consciences and first and foremost the United Nations which was quite rightly established to address these situations around the world. For instance, we see tensions uh, related to the war in Ukraine and its repercussions on the affected civilian populations as well as its impact around the world, both on our economies and our food and energy supply. Another one of these tests that we are facing was the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic which disrupted all of our lives. Today the world is struggling to recover from the shock caused by COVID-19. It was an unprecedented challenge that we experienced and endured. We saw the loss of millions of human lives and harmful consequences on the health, social and economic levels. The recent lull shouldn't lead us to let down our guard. The lessons that we've learned from this fateful period should lead us to further consolidate multilateral cooperation. Because multilateralism was what was needed when states and organizations rallied around, came together and worked together to overcome this scourge. We hope to see further consolidation of this multilateral cooperation, particularly when it comes to tackling other persistent and recurrent crises and challenges such as wars, terrorism, climate change, health and food crises, poverty, just to cite a few. That's why this session is an opportunity to once again reaffirm our commitment to the ideals, principles and purposes of the United Nations Charter and to renew our collective commitment to make them a reality, particularly through the implementation of the recommendations made in the Declaration of Heads of State and Government at the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the UN. It is time to act in order to make these goals a reality by correcting the many shortcomings that we have seen throughout the existence of our organization which have allowed the problems undermining our international society and hamper the full achievement of the promises contained in the Charter to persist. In this regard, the Secretary General's initiative, Our Common Agenda, is a, an action plan aimed at strengthening and speeding up the implementation of multilateral agreements, particularly the 2030 Agenda, and to bring tangible change to people's lives. It's particularly welcome. It does indeed represent a great leap in the right direction. Chad supports this initiative fully 
and we hope that it will lead to promoting and strengthening a multilateralism that brings specific solutions to the major challenges of our time. A type of multilateralism that is able to have a real impact on people's lives, particularly in poor countries, and not a sham multilateralism that boils down to little more than hollow statements. In this regard, we would note that this year, seven years after the adoption of the 2030 Agenda and three years since the proclamation here in New York of the Decade of Action to Speed Up the Achievement of the SDGs, the results from their implementation are far from being achieved, in particularly for poor countries. As was underscored by the Secretary General in his report on this, these goals will not be attained and many will fall by the wayside if we do not take bold action. Worse still, we could see a downward spiral and disillusionment taking root in the hearts of millions of people around the world. That's why, following on from the call of heads of state and government at the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, the Secretary General's initiative, Our Common Agenda, gives us the hope that our legitimate expectations from international agreements and programs, particularly the 2030 Agenda, might be met. Mr. President, all of our action converges towards sustainable development, but development is only possible if there are lasting peace and security. That's why our state's efforts to achieve these aims require increased and constant support. International commitments made to that end through the 2030 Agenda, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, the Paris Agreement, the New Urban Agenda, and all other international agendas must be honoured. And that, if we want to reach the ultimate goal of ensuring that no one is left behind and that we have a planet that we want to live on, which can be bequeathed surely and proudly to future generations. To do this, and in the face of worsening, compounding challenges that are shaking the very foundations of our collective action, it's crucial to keep up and strengthen existing commitments made by virtue of crucial solidarity linking our states with each other, particularly the rich and the poor. Firstly, through official development assistance and through the implementation of economic and financial empowerment initiatives and sustainable development policies for least developed countries and landlocked developing countries. Mr. President, despite, despite geopolitical divisions and diverse forms of obstacles, any trend or temptation towards reducing development assistance would be counterproductive. It would risk further worsening the crises around the world. That's why Chad calls on donor countries to keep up and expand development assistance and this through the United Nations system, which provides invaluable relief to hundreds of millions of people around the world whose very survival depends on it. And while I am on this subject, I must also mention the issue of debt, which continues to represent too heavy a burden for many developing countries, including Chad. This burden truly strangles our economies, hampering post-COVID recovery or any economic recovery that might be strong enough to allow for the implementation of sustainable development programs. 
That's why debt relief remains an absolute imperative to drive economic recovery in low-income countries and to brighten the somber outlook for the global economy. With this in mind, Chad reiterates its support for the various appeals and initiatives to cancel or restructure debt for developing countries. Thus, I would also wish to appeal for the swift materialization of facilities already allocated to my country under these initiatives that have been launched by various multilateral bodies in order to allow us to, to respond to the pressing needs of our people who are already facing the combined effects of structural economic problems, humanitarian emergencies, insecurity caused by the terrorist threat, harmful effects from climate change, the food crisis, just to cite a few examples. Mr. President, turning now to the political situation in my country, as you know, we have seen a political transition since the 20th of April 2021. I would like to tell you now that the process uh, this transition process is making satisfactory headway. The Transitional Military Council, led by General Mahamat Idris Debi Itno, and the Transitional Government are committed to seeing it to its conclusion in order to allow our country to find lasting peace once again and to focus on the only worthwhile battle which is refounding Chad for the well-being of all Chadians, the national inclusive and sovereign dialogue which should lead to the holding of democratic, free and transparent elections is ongoing. It brings together the lifeblood of our country and and political and military movements who were included thanks to the Doha Agreement signed on the 8th of August 2022. From this rostrum, I would also once again like to express my profound, the profound thanks of the government and people of Chad to the government of the state of Qatar and to its, His Highness Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, the Emir of the state of Qatar, who hosted and facilitated the pre-dialogue between the Chadian government and the political, political and military groups. The national inclusive and sovereign dialogue represents an historic opportunity for Chadians to decide with full sovereignty as to the reform of their country. Political parties, civil society, political and military groups, professions, women, young people, persons with disabilities, the diaspora, traditional and religious leaders, law enforcement forces, all of the Chadian society is being represented. This is an historic opportunity for Chadians to fully and sovereignly decide on the reform of their country. Any matters relating to national life are being discussed there openly, freely and sovereignly. Decisions and recommendations emerging from this dialogue will be binding on all. Chad counts on its partners for their support and financing for the implementation of the decisions and recommendations stemming from this process. Of course, a few political and military groups decided not to participate in this historic meeting. Efforts are ongoing to bring our brothers and sisters to reconsider their choice and to rejoin the path of dialogue. Mr. President, the situation in the Sahel region and the Lake Chad Basin principally affects security and development. It remains just as worrisome as ever because it continues to worsen due to the combined effects of several factors including institutional changes, climate change, a breakdown in military arrangements to tackle terror the terrorist threat, 
unchecked illegal migration and increasing uncurbed forms of illicit trafficking. In security terms, we note heightening terrorist activities in the Sahel, spreading relentlessly to neighboring regions in West Africa and the Horn of Africa, where we have seen terrorist attacks, particularly in Togo, Burkina Faso, and Benin. In light of the continued deterioration of the situation, Chad has continued to call for us to rethink our approach to the Sahel situation to better tailor our responses thereto. In this regard, Chad welcomes the United Nations and African Union initiative to conduct a joint strategic assessment in the Sahel in partnership with ECOWAS and the G5 Sahel. We also welcome the appointment of the former president of Niger, His Excellency Mr. Isufu Mahamadou, to lead the independent panel on security and development in the Sahel. This panel is tasked with leading this particular assessment. We have no doubt that President Isufu and his team will conduct a detailed appraisal of the ills blighting the sub-region and will suggest answers that will help us to recalibrate our response to this multidimensional crisis, which, despite all of the efforts made, continues to worsen year on year. It's true that the Sahel is replete with strategies, plans, programs, all aimed at combating this crisis. States and their bilateral and multilateral partners have rolled out several projects, projects over the last almost 10 years, which always fail to meet our expectations. The strategic assessment will allow us to understand the causes of this, even though we are all aware that the terrorism blighting the Sahel will only be beaten with a return to peace and state authority in Libya. Hence why the numerous initiatives adopted by member states both at the national and sub-regional level continue to suffer significantly from a lack of appropriate resources for their implementation. For instance, the G5 Sahel Joint Force struggles to obtain long-term predictable resources to conduct its activities. This is why, once again, Chad calls on its partners to support the G5 Sahel in order to save the region from a deeper descent into spiralling violence. I reiterate the call of the Heads of State of the G5 Sahel for lasting and predictable funding from United Nations assessed contributions for the G5 Sahel Joint Force. Turning now to the internal G5 Sahel situation, we have seen the exit of our sister republic of Mali, and we particularly regret this withdrawal Mex because Mali is a founding member of this organization and it belongs alongside us. We won't be able to defeat terrorism, stabilize and develop the Sahel without a common fight and without pooling our resources. We hope that our Malian brothers will reconsider their decision and rejoin our common organization. The G5 Sahel's doors remain wide open to them. Mr. President, turning now to the situation in Libya, Chad is particularly worried by the persistent political deadlock leading to the confrontations in Tripoli on the 26th and 27th of August this year. Chad urges Libyan political actors to favor dialogue in order to save the peace process and also to implement the electoral calendar that they have agreed. Chad encourages the international community, particularly the United Nations and the African Union, to pursue their efforts in order to narrow the space between the different parties to the conflict and to foster a political dialogue because the Libyan crisis can 
only be resolved through by peaceful means through an inclusive political dialogue conducted by the Libyans themselves. The persistent conflict in Libya represents a constant threat for neighbouring countries and the whole of the Sahel region. Chad has paid and continues to pay a high price. Here Chad reiterates once again to the Security Council and to the Secretary General its request for the implementation of the disarmament, demobilization and reinsertion reintegration program which represents a lasting solution to resolve the issue of Chadian nationals joining various Libyan military factions. With regard to Cuba, Chad calls for the lifting of the economic and commercial blockade imposed by the American government on this country which continues to weigh heavily on the lives of its population. In terms of the Security Council reform, the main body in charge of international peace and security, once again Chad urges member states to move from rhetoric to action in order to make this reform a reality and to correct the historical injustice to the African continent that prevents this body from enjoying full and equal participation. Here Chad will continue to provide its full support to the common African position as spelled out in the Ezelwini consensus and other documents. In concluding, I wish every success to our work and I thank you very much. We are watching live the statements of the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs of Chad, Awatif Altijani Hamed Koiboro. The official said the UN faces some unprecedented challenges since its creation, adding that only by coming together can the world hope to face those challenges. Stay tuned with Telesur, we will provide more updates in upcoming news briefs.